Okay, um, welcome everybody. Uh, we are today. We have Sebastian Farquhar. I hope I pronounced that well. Um, here with us, he is uh, at the moment a junior research fellow at Christchurch University of Oxford, uh, where he is finishing uh, his PhD with uh, in Gal, and he has been working on really uh, great work on. Act typically on active learning, but there has been quite a few more things along the way. Uh, since we are also very interested in active learning and we are actively working on, uh, on these topics, uh, applying these methods in, in on the real world problems, we are really curious uh, to hear what Sebastian has to say. Um, right, Sebastian, I, uh, we want to take Take it off from here. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, and yes, I'm very happy to answer questions as we go along. I'll also definitely leave some time at the end for questions if people have things they want to save up. Um, just to say a little bit more about the sorts of things that I've worked on, I've thought about a lot of what I do is trying to understand how we evaluate Bayesian deep learning methods and how we can tell when we're doing well at Bayesian deep learning or poorly. Um, because I think it's, it's not at all obvious. And one way to think about when we're doing well or poorly is whether it, it works for different applications of uncertainty and active learning might be one of those where um, what we'd like to do is understand what we know about a problem and use that to guide us as we think about what to learn, what data to gather in the future. And in principle, if we're doing a good job of understanding our own state of knowledge and what we know about the world conditioned on that, um, we should be better at exploring and better at learning than we would be otherwise. And that's the goal of active learning. And the work I'm going to talk about today is something that I got into actually because it, it seemed like a spot where active learning performance pulls apart from what you might think of as good Bayesian deep learning performance. And so there are some interesting differences between doing a good job at active learning and doing some really nice principled probabilistic modeling um, in at least some settings. So that's something we'll dig into. Now, normally in this part of the talk, I would give a bit of a spiel about why active learning is important. Um, and I actually removed that from this talk because I thought that you guys would all definitely be on board with this already. Um, I might just add a few, just based on our, our little conversation before the start of the talk, just a few motivating ideas here, which is that when we're doing active learning, it's because um, we'd like to be more data efficient. Um, we have some big pool of possible observations and we can't label them all, or we can't dig into them all to gather more data about all of them. And so we'd like to use what we know already, um, both our model, the data we've already labeled, and our knowledge about the space of data that we could label to um, reduce the amount of, of money or time we spend on labeling, on retraining models, and so on. And, and later in the talk, I'll talk a little bit about how this isn't just about learning, this can also be about understanding how good your model already is. And it might be important to be data efficient, not just in the learning stage, but also in the model evaluation stage. So here is one of the, the core things I wanna talk about today, which is that when we do this active learning, when we pick parts of the data to um, use for training our models and not others, we introduce a bias. Uh, so let's make that a little bit more precise by looking at this picture. Here we have uh, sort of just X, Y data points, really, really simple. It's just a line, it's a curve. And the, the underlying data, these little black dots, are spaced unevenly and are clustered. So there's much more data near the middle than there is around the edges. This left-hand cluster has very little data and the right-hand cluster is a little bit. And we might think when we have our active learning hat on that we would like to spread out the observations that we train on. So these red Xs, we've then picked out of all of the points in the pool that we could acquire 
using a heuristic, in this case, one based on spread along the x-axis. And we've wound up with good information about the whole range of x. This seems like it would be useful. And then we can train on this. We call that detrain. And the trouble is that if you, if you draw a line through your red points, um, <laughs> the colors here are a little inconvenient. They're from some other figures. But this uh, blue line is what you get if you draw a linear regression straight through the red points. And it's quite different from the one you get if you draw it through the black points um, because we've introduced a bias by the way we've collected our, our train samples. So this R hat um, is what you, this is the, the risk that we're trying to minimize by fitting our line over all the data points. And this blue R tilde is the risk that you have uh, just averaged over the acquired points, only the data that you've actually collected in this case. So the, the black line is not something that we have access to. Um, and so one thing that's puzzling here is, in principle, if you're using a biased estimator um, for your, your risk and you're doing empirical risk minimization, you're really optimizing the wrong target. So you are like the loss that you're estimating from your mini batch um, estimator of the, the risk you're minimizing is just a different thing from the population risk. And in principle, that should mean that it won't generalize well to the test data. You won't get good performance. And this was certainly our ingoing hypothesis that this was a, a real problem. Basically, we were hoping, okay, you remove the bias. We now train with the correct loss. Everything's going to work better. And we were puzzled to a certain extent. People generally ignore this bias. Um, most papers either don't mention it or explicitly say they're not going to worry about it. And everything still seems to sort of work in active learning. But we said to ourselves, you know, maybe um, things will work even better once we fix the bias. Maybe it's a noisy proxy for the thing we actually care about. Um, and a slight spoiler, that isn't what we ended up deciding what was going on. Um, so we show in this paper with, um, two of my colleagues here in Oxford, Yaren and Tom, how to remove this bias by reweighting the, the data. Um, so instead of doing this blue R tilde, where we average over the acquired data, we instead compute a weighted average over the acquired data with this R lure, um, which is the leveled unbiased risk estimator. And I'll explain in a bit what leveled here means. And the magic is all in how this weight, this V sub M is calculated, because this is the thing that's going to, to remove the bias. And this is based at its core on something like important sampling plus correcting for the fact that the pool you're drawing from is fixed and you're not redrawing points over and over again, because that would be wasteful. Um, so the sort of the one equation in the whole paper that does the heavy lifting is this one. We've got R lure, which is this weighted average by V. And here's what V is. Uh, we don't need to, to dig into exactly what's dividing what and where and why. The important things are that this depends on the total size of the entire training pool, N, um, the total number of points that you've acquired that go into your risk estimator, big M, so this is the total number of points that you have labels for at this moment. It might grow in the future as you continue to, to acquire more data. Little m, which is the index for which that specific data point was acquired. So for the very first data point, it would be one and then going up to two and so on and so forth. Um, and it's important to keep track of the order that you acquire data in. Uh, simply because if you don't do this, if you use the most naive version of this estimator that doesn't adjust for this sort of thing, you end up overweighting the data that you sample early on in the training process. And then perhaps one of the most important parts here is this uh, Q, which is an acquisition proposal distribution. This is the probability with which you acquired that particular label. Um, conditioned on all of the things you've acquired so far and all of the remaining data. And one thing, you know, if you work on active learning, you might think, well, hang on, normally we just acquire a specific point. We don't 
we don't have a distribution necessarily. We just uh, acquire the point that maximizes some score, maybe a bold score or something like this. Um, and that's right. We need to do something stochastic here. It doesn't work for this estimator to have a deterministic acquisition function. You need to be doing it in a way that has at least some probability of acquiring any of the points. Um, but that probability can be fairly small. So two of the things that we use in the paper as, as ways to get this distribution is one, a sort of a soft max distribution um, tied to, for example, a bold score or some other normal uh, active learning acquisition function. And this gives you a way of sampling more likely the points that have higher scores with still some probability of the others. Or you can use an epsilon greedy kind of score. Um, in fact, uh, I have some newer work with another co-author suggesting that doing this sort of stochastic acquisition can be helpful for other reasons, um, especially when you're doing batch learning. Uh, so it's not a big constraint that you have to do this stuff stochastically. In fact, it might be helpful for other reasons, but it is important um, for, for making the math work here. Uh, and so we show some stuff in the paper that I'm not going to go into in detail here. These estimators, this R lure is, is unbiased. So unlike the normal way of doing things, if you do active learning in this way, you have an unbiased estimator of the loss that you care about on the population. Um, they're consistent. So you know, they're, the variance tends to zero as the, the sample size gets tends to infinity. Um, we can describe the variance in considerably more detail. In particular, for like typical data, the variance is lower than the biased estimator's variance. Um, and the sort of typical usage there is a little bit hard to be precise about. But loosely what's going on here is that if your acquisition distribution is good enough that you're tending to pick informative points, then the variance falls below the naive version. If something is wrong with your acquisition distribution and you're systematically getting uninformative points, then your variance could be higher. Um, and this is something we can talk about in questions as well, because I, I think this opens some interesting questions about what kinds of assumptions you are comfortable making about how good your model is when you're using it to guide your exploration. Um, but of course, if we think we're doing something remotely useful with this whole active learning thing, implicitly we're making some assumption that our model has something useful to say about the data and other data that we might be able to gather. Um, and we can describe the optimal zero variance acquisition distribution. Um, and this uses standard results from importance sampling that if you're able to sample proportionally to the true expected loss, um, then actually you only need one data point to get the right risk uh, estimator. Um, of course, we can't sample proportionally to the true expected loss. If we could, we'd sort of already have the answer. But we think this offers some guidance in the design of good acquisition distributions. Um, Uh, there's an alternative estimator that I'll only briefly mention here, which uses important sampling more directly and has this sort of fixed pool correction term more directly. Uh, and we use our lure instead of this pure or plain unbiased risk estimator because it adds a, a leveling, um, which has a bunch of nice properties. The leveling that we mean is that the expectation of the weight is one for all of the data points. And if you don't do this leveling trick, then the expected value of the weight is higher for earlier points in the, the acquisition process. So the lower your index, the higher the expected value of V. Um, and that's unnecessary and increases the, the variance of your estimator. Um, there's a bunch of other nice stuff about the, the leveled estimator, sort of nice properties as M tends to N and so on. So it, it has some extra desirable features, but this pure estimator already does the job of being an unbiased reweighting of the, the naive way of doing the, um, the risk estimation for active learning. Ah, here we go. This is what I just said. <laughs> 
Uh, and so let's just show how this works on a graph. So this is going back to our original um, data. We had the ideal fit on the whole pool, this black line, which we don't have access to because we can't see the whole pool. We have the unweighted naive version, this blue line, where we've just fit a line to the training data. And then we have our corrected version that uses this leveled unbiased risk estimator, um, just using these red points and recovers almost exactly what we would have gotten had we been able to train on all of the data, including the data we don't have labels to. Um, now, this is just a toy linear model. Toy linear models work differently from things like neural networks, which is most of what I work on. Um, just, just for context, I know a lot of people using GPs um, for active learning as well. Uh, so we should you know, double check that some of the stuff is working in those settings as well. Um, and in fact, we can show, hang on. Okay. I've, I've, skipped a slide somewhere in the preparation of this, this thing. So I, I guarantee you that there's a graph very similar to this one showing that uh, things work similarly for neural networks, but the consequences of those are very different. And that's what we're looking at here. Um, so we're looking on the one hand at a, a 1D linear regression where we're acquiring more samples. That's the x-axis, this M. So we're acquiring larger and larger sets of data. And we're looking at the population risk of the model that you end up getting when you train on um, your various estimators of risk and then keep improving the model, acquiring more data, retraining the model, and so on using that estimator. And for the linear regression, when you train with either of our corrected versions, so the pure or lure, you almost immediately you know, after 20 or so samples on this 1D linear regression, you get to the same population risk, which, you know, we estimate just as the, the risk on the whole test set um, that you would have gotten had you acquired 100 points or something like that. Uh, whereas if you're training with this biased estimator, actually it takes quite some time. You need to acquire much more data before you reach a model of the same quality. Uh, but you get a different story for a Bayesian neural network. Um, and this is, you know, again, a relatively simple data set, fashion amnest, um, but active learning experiments are quite expensive because you need to retrain the model again and again. So this is a, the best proxy that we were able to get at the time with the compute available. Um, but what we see here is that there's no really obvious difference looking at this plot where the shaded regions are standard deviation in the empirical test risk that you'd get from using any of these different estimators. Um, in fact, if you look at the version that's standard error instead of standard deviation, the naive estimator, this sort of biased estimator performs slightly better than either of our unbiased estimators. Mm. Now, this really surprised us. Um, we were expecting, you know, the bias means you're training towards the wrong objective. If you fix it, you train towards the right objective. Um, so things are going to get better. And we've already shown, actually, this it's not harmful because it increases variance. On the contrary, it decreases variance. Um, so we were extra puzzled because sort of the obvious answer is, well, maybe it's hurting because the variance is getting worse. So in order to understand what's going on in there, I think we need to step back and consider different sources of bias. One source of bias is the, the pool bias. So this is the difference between the unlabeled training data, the whole pool, and the true distribution. We can basically just ignore this bias. This is this is the same problem that anyone doing any kind of machine learning has all the time, that the data you've gathered doesn't represent reality. So let's set this aside, ignore it. Then we've got this active sampling bias. This is the difference between the acquired data and the unlabeled training data. So there's a bias in how we've collected and gathered the subset of the pool that we've chosen to put labels on. And that subset of data is different from all the other data for example, because we've tried to you know, spread it out in space or we've um, 
picked confusing or low probability um, data points or, or something like this, where we've used some clustering algorithm. For whatever reason, the distribution of the acquired data and the unlabeled data is different. That's why we're doing active learning in the first place. So that's one source of bias. And that's the source of bias we were trying to address with our work. And then there's this third source of bias, which is the bias that people probably actually most often think about in machine learning, which is coming from the fact that you're overfitting, that you're training on a specific set of data, and that that introduces its own form of bias because you're, you're picking a model that does particularly well on that data that you've seen, as opposed to unseen other data that you might encounter in the future, the source of generalization error. And we can measure specifically which portion of the bias is coming from overfitting um, relative to which part is coming from active learning by looking at the difference between the true test risk and the estimated risk um, using our, our active learning removing estimators. And what we see is sort of interestingly that the um, basically the overfitting bias is super, super um, small for the 1D regression case, makes sense. It's a sort of underspecified model really for the data it was trying to explore. Whereas for the, the Bayesian neural network, the overfitting bias is pretty substantial, um, quite significant in, in, in size. It is opposite in sign from the active learning bias, and it is roughly equal in magnitude. And what we hypothesize, therefore, is that when you're doing active learning with a, uh, an overspecified model that's capable of learning a lot of fine detail, maybe more detail than is represented in the data, and you have a real possibility of significant overfitting, um, the active learning bias that you're introducing, where you're more likely to find surprising data that's not well explained by the, the current data, is actively regularizing and sort of canceling out with some of this other bias. So the active learning as a tool is doing more than just helping you find the right kinds of data um, to include new information. It's providing a sort of regularization role that cancels out some of the potential your model might otherwise have to overfit. Right, so that's, that's sort of part one of the talk. Um, some of the initial explorations of bias and active learning. Um, and one place this led us to is thinking about settings where we, we just want to estimate without bias. We're going to set aside and ignore, we don't care about for the moment, what's the downstream effect of any bias we might be introducing um, through active learning on the eventual quality of the model. We just want to know right now for this model, there is no room for overfitting anymore because we finished training it. What is the quality of that model? What's its test risk? What's its test loss? Can I tell you for a second? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just going back to the pool bias, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps I missed it, but um, what about that source of bias? That seems to me like it's maybe a, a likely cause of the issue with BNNs. Yeah, so I mean, to clarify, this is so whenever you do machine learning of any kind, you have a data set, right? And ultimately, you're going to be deploying it in some other distribution. Um, so one way of thinking about this is the difference between your test distribution and the actual genuine distribution that you really care about. So this is a really important source of bias, but it's a very hard one to address using any standard statistical techniques, because by definition, you don't have access to the sort of the real distribution you care about beyond the, the test distribution. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. It's just, just I'm thinking also about Bayesian optimization setting where you don't necessarily have a yeah you have data that you collect but you you can also sample anywhere right not not just from the available data points in the pool mm -hmm. right so it's 
slightly different setting and I think there you might be able to come up with methods to address it but yeah just bring yeah something. potentially or, or maybe in that setting this pool bias thing doesn't exist because it's not so for example if I could genuinely like say my inputs are from Rn and I can genuinely get labels for any possible point in Rn, then I think there isn't this pool bias here. This pool bias is coming from mm, it depends a little. So I think this might not be an issue for Bayesian optimization, but maybe we should talk about this more in the discussion. I think that's an interesting point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Mm, yeah, interesting. So uh, thinking then about situations where we want unbiased risk estimators, model evaluation is an important one of these. We want to know how good our model is. And most of the like active learning literature doesn't pay an awful lot of attention to testing and the expense of data at test time. But for many of the settings where we, we find it expensive to do learning, we also find it expensive to do testing. And so what we'd like is to be able to get a, an estimate of our test loss um, using as little data as possible. And active testing is a way of doing something like that uh, using very similar tricks to what we had in the previous paper. And so this is work that was led by a colleague of mine, Yannick Cawson, um, also here at Oxford, who uh, is a PhD student working with Yaren and Tom and has done some really outstanding work in a lot of things related to this. And here again is just a, a motivating figure from a really a toy setting. This is a linear regression setting where on the left, we have this range of differences between our risk estimator and what we know from a sort of an oracle, what's the actual test loss. And with this active testing scheme, which uses very similar principles to the, this unbiased risk estimator from the previous paper, you're able to get really quite tight estimates of the test loss with very few points. I mean, actually, even with one point, you're doing surprisingly well. Um, and with 10 points, you're doing better than with three times more test data than uh, that you would have if you're sort of randomly selecting test data points to evaluate your model with. And here's how we're thinking about the approach. We're trying to find the most useful test data we can. So much like with active learning, you're trying to find the most useful training data. Here, you're trying to find useful test points. So you want, especially you want to find places that might have a very high loss. Um, and you especially want places where the model thinks that the loss is going to be low, but in fact, it's wrong and the loss is going to be high. And the way we do this is using a second model trained generally on the same data, um, although there's no reason it couldn't include extra data as well. Uh, you can use ensembles here. You can use different architectures. So we've had some success you know, with a, a main model that's a neural network and a secondary model that's like a decision tree. Um, the idea being here that you're sort of trying to get it to make different kinds of mistakes. It, it's not necessary that the surrogate model is, is better than the original model at all. It just needs to be different and making different sorts of mistakes. One thing that's interesting is uh, because we're just trying to estimate the, the test loss of the original model um, and remove the bias there, there's, there's actually no problem whatsoever with using our test data to retrain our surrogate models. Um, this may be a slightly surprising fact that you can improve your estimate of which test data is going to be useful using other test data without introducing its own bias, but it, it turns out to be true. You can use a more powerful surrogate. In some applications, this is relevant. Um, for example, if you're trying to evaluate a, uh, a model that will be cheap to deploy in a uh, resource limited setting 
but in the test phase, you can potentially train a much larger or more powerful model. Um, it's something that, that some applications might find useful, but it's absolutely not necessary for this method to work. Um, here is a, a complicated slide um, in which I'm describing the, the, the function that we're using to acquire the test data. This is this Q distribution, this distribution over the possible indices that we could acquire. Um, much like for the, the previous paper with active learning, where we had this Q distribution as the acquisition probability for the training data, here it's for the test data. And we're using a slightly different function here. We're trying to find points where there's high expected disagreement um, but also predictive variance. So what we care about is finding things where the surrogate and the, the test model disagree, um, but also where, uh, according to the, the surrogate, we think there's high epistemic uncertainty um, and aleatoric uncertainty. So we're looking for things where the, the variance of the expected value of the label is high but also where the expected value of the variance of the label is high. Um, and all of these terms contribute to things that might um, reveal high loss areas. Because what we're just trying to do is sample according to the expected value of the loss on the test distribution. Um, and here are some just toy examples of how this works in relatively small data settings where we've got the model and data coming from different kinds of distributions or, or the same. So where the, the model and data might both be drawn from a GP or from quite different data distributions. And in all of these situations, we find that doing this sort of active testing reduces the amount of data that you need to sample to get some particular um, variance with respect to your expected risk um, to some low level. Um, and that's the way we're thinking about evaluating this sort of approach, right? It's like whenever you're doing any sort of model evaluation, you have some variance for how good your estimate of the model quality is. And data efficient model evaluation is therefore all about hitting some threshold acceptable variance with as little data as you possibly can. Now, there are other ways you can think about model evaluation um, and data efficient model evaluation. You might care not about the uh, typical case or expected case, you might want like bounds so you never put into practice a really, really dreadful model. Um, that's not something we're focusing on here now with this, but you could imagine a different acquisition distribution, which instead tried to protect those bounds rather than um, the sort of more typical case that we're exploring. And then stepping away from those toy settings, here are a few slightly less toy settings. Um, CIFAR 110 and Fashion Amnest, where you can see a few things going on. So let's let's zoom in on figure A. So here we have the, the median squared error on the y-axis and the number of acquired points on the x-axis. So the lower this line, the um, better your uh, estimate of the population losses. And the further to the left, the less data you needed to achieve that. So for fashion MNIST, our method is working really well. This is all using a ResNet. Um, for CIFAR 10, it's working pretty well. For CIFAR 100, it's working less well. And I think what this is highlighting is the extent to which you can get more data efficient, the better your model is at capturing what's going on in the test distribution. So. This, I think, raises one of the, the interesting dynamics of this whole approach, which is it helps you do even better if you're already doing fairly well, right? So if you've already got a model that's doing a pretty good job on the data, it helps you establish this more quickly. But if your model has no clue what's going on at all, you know, not CIFAR 100, but imagine we were using the same ResNet on ImageNet um, without any sort of modifications, I would expect it to perform quite poorly because the model has such a poor grasp of what's going on that it's unable to prioritize the data well. And so you might think about, is this an acceptable trade-off? Do we like the idea that 
in the case where our model is doing really badly, it sort of then misleads us also about the quality of the model. Um, my current feeling is that this is okay because usually you already kind of know if your model's in the ballpark of being useful and you only really care about data efficient estimates of the, the model loss if you already think that it's a contender. It's like sort of plausible that it's understanding what's going on. Um, and so in the sorts of settings where this active testing stuff will work, I think those will be the same settings where you care about um, getting a good estimate of the risk. And in the settings where it doesn't work, you probably weren't going to be deploying this model anyhow, because it's probably sufficiently obvious that it's not really working. But you know, I think that's something that's up for discussion and it's a, definitely a limitation in where you can deploy this sort of stuff practically. And then this bottom figure, figure B, is another way we have of thinking about how good your model evaluation is, um, which is this relative labeling cost, uh, which is how much data do you need to hit some target uh, error level uh, or variance in your estimator um, relative to what the naive strategy of just sampling IID from your test distribution would have provided. So the dark orange line is by definition at one. You need exactly as much data with IID as you would with IID. Um, and then these other lines show for the, the amount of variance that you got with that level, that with the IID strategy at that number of acquired points, how much data could you have saved um, by using one of the, the active testing strategies instead? And for those cases where the model understands things pretty well, the sort of CIFAR 10, CIFAR, uh, CIFAR 10 and fashion and mist, you get really quite big savings um, with relative labeling costs in the sort of one quarter to a third range for most of the interesting um, uh, numbers of acquired points. It gets even better at really low acquired points, but uh, I think those don't matter so much. Whereas for CIFAR 100, you're still getting a saving, um, but it's significantly less, sort of in the like half to two thirds kind of range for um, the more interesting range of acquired points. And as you acquire more and more points, the, the benefit of doing this actively reduces, which is exactly the same sort of thing that one observes in active learning generally. Um, and I, I want to briefly mention, uh, because it, it was just accepted at NERPS yesterday or the day before, this follow-on paper from Yannick, my colleague, uh, in which so he, he led that work and was the lead author and has been pursuing some other approaches based on this kind of strategy, but where you now allow yourself maybe biased estimators of the model evaluation, but you're still interested in the same thing of generally having small errors relative to the true test risk um, for whatever your estimator is of the, the other test risks. Just now you're allowing yourself some bias, but maybe dramatically reducing the variance and potentially with quite small biases. And here, so he calls his method active surrogate estimators, ASE. Um, and this mostly works by using some auxiliary model to estimate the loss on um, unobserved data, as well as to guide which data to observe um, in order to refine and improve the estimates of the, of the loss. And um, in both CIFAR 100 and CIFAR 10, while the sort of the lure-based strategies of the kinds that, that were discussed in that previous paper are ways of getting more efficient model evaluation, um, the ASC is able to be even more efficient um, and dramatically so, and sort of quite close to the theoretically optimal results, which are provided by this sort of shaded region around the gray dotted line. That's sort of the, the theoretically optimal estimator that you could have gotten in that situation, um, given the, the variance of the test pool. So before I just wrap up, I'll, I'll summarize what we've talked about and, and what we might want to discuss. So active learning has this bias problem. In some settings, it does appear that it is 
genuinely a problem. So if you're doing something with a, an, an under, uh, underspecified model where overfitting isn't a concern, you may well introduce a substantial amount of bias and a problematic kind of bias by actively learning without thinking about how you're, you're handling that. But it's possible to remove this um, using some important sampling techniques, and you can improve on naive important sampling techniques using some extra tricks. Um, but this isn't actually always a problem, um, especially we think in overfit models, but there may be more stuff going on here as well. Um, but using these sorts of unbiased techniques lets you start doing active model evaluation where you might really want an unbiased estimator of your test loss and do that with as little data as possible. Um, and then I guess the new takeaway from this new paper that will be coming out very, very soon at NURBS is that in fact, if you're willing to allow yourself a small amount of bias, you can improve even further on that. And I think all of these, you know, as I mentioned on, on a previous slide, all of these face this really interesting conundrum about how much you trust your model any approach to active learning at some level is trying to take advantage of what the model knows, the, the knowledge that's already encoded in the model in order to guide and shape your exploration and how you incorporate new data in the future. But making assumptions that are too strong, that your model's like really good, potentially feels a little bit risky and might be something that one doesn't want to do, at least not without being somewhat careful about it. And all of these methods sort of I think play with that that edge. Um, what kinds of assumptions can you make about how good your model already is when you think about how you're exploiting it to gather more data in order to refine that model in the future? Thanks. Very good. No, that was excellent. Lots of food for thought, I'm sure. Um, right. So. We have a bit of time for discussion. Um, I can definitely start. Um, in Bayesian optimization, we have slightly different problems, mm -hmm. but also in active learning, in certain types of active learning. For, for example, if you want to learn a feasible region, uh, so you, you want to learn a subset of all points and you will need to mo models to be accurate, uh, not in the whole, search space, right? Uh, how do you, what is model evaluation there? In, in a way, if you're looking for, in Bayesian optimization, if you're looking for a optimum, uh, you want your models to be accurate where it matters. Elsewhere, you don't necessarily care. So yeah, do you have any kind of guidance for these kind of settings? Yeah, interesting. Um, so, I mean, with the, the feasible region thing, I mean, I imagine you could, in many settings, just constrain your search and your estimate over the range that you, you care about. So I'm not sure exactly the application you have in mind, but it sounds like you would lose relatively little in the model evaluation part with just restricting your search to the, you know, the X domain that that you actually think is is important to you, and not looking at anything outside of that region. Um, that might not be good enough in learning because you might be able to learn something about the region of interest by looking at data outside the region of interest potentially. Um, but for evaluation, I think probably that hack would just be enough. Um, the Bayesian optimization one is. Or maybe I'll let you react to that before I, I look at Bayesian optimization. Does that sound plausible to you for the, the feasible region sub problem? Yeah, I think so, but uh, perhaps a limited extent because there is still a lot of uncertainty where the feasible region is exactly. So you don't want to necessarily limit that. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be something that you want to explicitly build into the um, the acquisition distribution. Um, I'm not sure about that. It's an interesting question. 
uh, thinking of Bayesian optimization, and I should, you know, I should just be super explicit. First thing, there are like, you know, biases and blind spots in how I think about this stuff. Um, I'm more, my headspace is focused more on like pool based active learning than even, uh, you know, streaming active learning or things like this, and less on Bayesian optimization and all of these like slightly subtly different things that end up mattering. And similarly, my, my thinking is often very colored by Bayesian neural networks and Bayesian deep learning, um, which has some different and interesting properties relative to things like GPs. Um, so when I'm saying something, definitely worth like interpreting that with those limitations in mind, um, which is not to say that I don't guarantee it won't extend beyond that, but like that's the thing that I will have thought the most about. But about Bayesian optimization, I mean, I guess one way of thinking about this is if you know you have some utility function, either in, in Y or X space, um, and then that's shaping where you care about accuracy for your, um, your estimate of the loss. And specifically there, you're looking for like optima as opposed to looking at like a good average or a good estimate. Usually when we, when we played with this stuff, we built it straight into the acquisition distribution. Um, so, you know, when we go back to here, where we were thinking, what's the acquisition distribution? Um, the focus here is about trying to estimate the expected value of the loss on the test distribution uh, and finding ways to get a better predictor of that expected value of the loss. Now, where did that come from? That came from, I'm not sure actually if I have this on a slide, but that came from this important sampling step where the optimal important sampling um, distribution here, this optimal Q that gives you a one sample estimator of the test risk is the one where you sample Q proportionally to the expected loss on the test distribution. So that's why we zoomed in on that way of doing it because we were trying to minimize that variance. Um, but if you had some other goal in mind, for example, trying to find an estimate of the, uh, you know, the highest loss points or the lowest loss points, you just want to build that into a different way of constructing this distribution would be my hunch. Right. Yeah, I guess acquisition functions, I mean, they exactly tell you where the algorithm thinks the, the, the optimum lies. So in a way you could use it to construct uh, a test set to uh, as reflect the where is it important for the model to be accurate. Yeah, and, and it's different to be right. You might think, well, I want these high loss regions as a means to an end to be accurate over the whole distribution. Or you might think I want to be specifically focusing on the high loss regions because, for example, you know, I want to integrate over this loss landscape and almost all the contributions are coming from the high loss regions. Or you might think, actually, I only need to know that one point. I just need to know what's the value of X that maximizes this. And those are all slightly different problems that will want different acquisition strategies. And so already in, I, I haven't gone into it here, um, did I just, uh, but in this paper, oh, sorry, did I stop sharing my screen? Yeah, you did. Uh, uh, I think I went to the end of the talk and PowerPoint decided that I had finished. Um, I mean, one useful bit there would be, um, it's not commonly done in Bayesian optimization, but you could do model selection, right? But then it really becomes the, the question, the important question is like, what is a good model for Bayesian optimization if you want to do that? And yeah, uh, 
Mm, can you say more? I'm not sure I understand. So if you want, as I said, it's not commonly done, but you might want to do a model select to see which one, which model is the best one to use uh, for, for next collecting next batch of points, for example. Uh, but it's not easy to figure out what is a good model uh, because it depends on exactly, it doesn't necessarily globally a current model. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best model. Yeah, and so we, we've toyed with this sort of a, a paper that's never been written, or at least that we keep thinking about, but I've never written. And I don't know if someone else out there has written it at some point, but you can think about this whole data efficient learning process from start to finish, where you have a bunch of different steps going on, right? You're like, you're acquiring data, you probably need to use some sort of validation data in order to pick which of your models you want to use in order to acquire more data. How do you select that validation data? Is there weird contamination between the different candidate models that you're picking between as your sort of your active learning models on the way um, that comes sort of via the, the selection of the validation set that you use? Um, if you know in advance that you're going to be doing some model selection step at the end of your active learning, where you have you know, a dozen different models under consideration, how should that shape the way you acquire training data and test data? Um, I'm not sure that I've seen any really careful studies of this sort of thing, but it seems potentially quite useful because you know, usually you don't just know in advance exactly which model you're going to use and what the test set is that sort of there's a bunch of artificial constraints that come from the the research problem that um sort of hide some of the kind of interesting conceptual problems that you need to solve with this stuff um, but just to go back to okay. the slide and the point that i was trying to make before i accidentally closed my my presentation um okay uh just to say that Yannick for this paper actually adopted a considerably different acquisition distribution that I think he ended up calling X-Wing, but maybe there was some last minute changes to the, the name of the, the acquisition function. But um, I think the goal was to find a way to make the, uh, the acronym X-Wing. Um, and uh, there, there were a bunch of extra considerations about sort of what kinds of data to include and why related to the specific nature of how ASC is constructed. Um, and in general, I think this sort of framework gives you like a, not quite a recipe, but nearly a recipe for how to construct acquisition functions based on what problem you specifically are trying to solve. Okay, very good. Um have to take a look at that. Um, but yeah, I think I took too much time with my questions. Um, anybody else? Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of questions or maybe just one question really. Um, yeah, I mean, thanks for the talk, first of all. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I guess, so you mentioned uh, essentially, as I understood it in the in this investigation into the biases, you've got this bias, which is kind of introduced by the way you sample points. And then that's, at least for BNNs, you argue, that's kind of uh, mitigated by this kind of reverse bias that you get from overfitting. Um, is, is that kind of just to make sure that I'm? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, so but I guess I, I'm a bit. Uh, well, I'd be interested if you could comment a bit more on that overfitting aspect, because I guess, first of all, with BNNs, you would kind of hope it doesn't overfit um, because you're kind of being Bayesian about your parameters. And then there's also potentially quite an interesting interaction between uh, your approximate inference and the quality of your approximate inference and the sort of overfitting you would get from that. Um, so did you do like any kind of investigation into those aspects? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, the first point is just on, is there overfitting or not? Uh, we find that there definitely is overfitting. Um, and so this is uh, this overfitting bias term here. Sorry, can you see my mouse or is that hidden? Uh, yeah, that's all good. Um, so there's overfitting bias here, uh, which is the, the difference between like the population risk. Now we don't actually have the population risk, but the, the entire test set risk and the unbiased risk estimator of the, the weights that we've got after a certain amount of training. And- Well, I think what Sebastian, the point that Sebastian is trying to make is if you've made an adequately Bayesian neural network, that's uh, an impossibility because overfitting is inherently a frequentist phenomenon, right? Um, so in some sense, okay, so, Two points here. One, I don't think we come that close to adequately Bayesian models with anything at least related to neural networks at the moment for that. But then I'm not sure that's true in that Bayesian inference on its own doesn't really say anything at all about any test distributions or like other data distributions in the future. It just says, you know, what, what distribution over my beliefs ought I have? Um, to explain the data that I've observed. And for a lot of practical problems, the only reason we care about that is because we care about some other data distribution or remove the word distribution if we want to put a Bayesian hat on for a moment. We care about some other data that we haven't collected yet in the future that we'd like to make good predictions on. And I think even a very good Bayesian model that's been following all the right sorts of Bayesian principles and has perfect inference um, might still perform better or worse on some other data, which one comes across in the future, depending on the nature of the data that was used to uh, carry out that inference. So it's it's not the case that a, a Bayesian, you know, if I take it's data- fitting, right? But that's right? not overfitting. You mean your performance is gonna depend dependent on your data and your priors. But the, the notion of overfitting is the collapse of a distribution to a single point, which is what was done in frequentist statistics. In Bayesian statistics, you have a distribution that's, it's, it's Strictly not overfitting. It's not. It's not what I would. It's not what I would, or at least a Mackay school would refer to as overfitting anyway. Yeah, I mean, it might be. Maybe a better way of thinking of it is just like, um, performing in a way that's not suitable for some other data that you care about performing well on. Um, I think it's similar enough to overfitting to. To have similar properties here, but. I'm open to be persuaded otherwise. Um, as for, so we tried uh, several different Bayesian approximations for this stuff. Um, these here are using uh, radial BNNVI. We also did um, normal mean field variational inference with Gaussians. We did Monte Carlo dropout. Um, we did swag, I think, for at least some of the experiments. Now, none of these are the sorts of things, you know, we did not use, for example, HMC. Um, I don't know what one would have gotten there. These neural networks were probably too large for that with anything less than, you know, giant Google TPUs. Can, can you remind what, what, what kind of neural networks did you test, like used? Um, so these specific experiments here were, I think, smallish CNNs. Uh, I don't remember the exact architecture, but something Lynette scale-ish. Um, and then for some of the other experiments for active testing, where like the compute requirements are a little bit more generous, uh, we used ResNets. Um, I think ResNet... 18, although I don't, it's possible we use some slightly larger resonance as well. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, if I could just follow up, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's just good to hear, I guess, that you explored a, like a, a sort of a, a pretty wide array of, of approximations for, for the BNNs and 
uh, but I guess, like, uh, did you ever consider something like a GP model? Like, because I'm, well, I, I realize that, like, you're dealing a lot with images, so that's probably not the most suitable type of model, but, like, in the toy example you gave with the um, with the linear regression, like there, I feel like maybe you could argue that it's uh, the problem is just that the model is just not expressive enough to really capture what's going on satisfactorily and have like reasonable uncertainty about it. Um, so yeah, well, I see you've got a slide on GP models here, so I'll, I'll just let you talk. So, but but can you say a little bit more about, so you're saying the problem is um, not having the expressive power. Uh, what problem specifically are you pointing at? Well, like, so for, for just like a really simple linear regression, you're, there's a lot of sort of constraint in like, the error the sorts of error bars you can get and that's kind of what you're using to guide your active learning i guess um like i uh, to to preface this i'm also by no means an expert on active learning but um like i wonder if there's sort of a in-between example where the model is more flexible you can get kind of better error bars um and like you don't have overfitting and whether this problem still like I think it would be hard to argue that like a GP would be prone to overfitting. Um, so like, and you can do inference like exactly if the data is small enough. Um, so I wonder if there's like, yeah, just what what can you glean from that sort of scenario where you've got an expressive model, um, good uncertainty, no real overfitting. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure. We didn't do any work with GPs for the paper that we were focusing explicitly on this bias problem. Um, that was only something that we started looking at with the active testing. And I'm trying to remember why, but I think the answer was we weren't sure, you know, when you look at um, this risk estimator um, and thinking about using that for training, it wasn't obvious to us what that meant for training a GP. Um, so it wasn't totally obvious, like what the right comparison point might be in that case. Um, and it might be that there are some good ideas for how to do that, but at least at that point in time, we sort of hadn't quite figured out how one could do that. The problem's a little bit different in the model evaluation case where you have a fixed model and you can, you know, you can evaluate the GP uh, performance on some data set using test data that are acquired according to this kind of distribution. And you don't need to think about, you know, okay, what does it mean to retrain my model using this weighted data? So that's why we didn't look at the GPs in, in this setting. Um, now, but do they have different properties for active learning? Uh, probably, I, I'm actually not really sure. Okay, yeah, no, that that's, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, you're right that it would take some thought to, to implement, to, to think about like how to actually apply this sort of modified loss to a GP. So yeah, um, yeah, I mean, thanks. Um, yeah, so it was less like, I don't know, I don't know how to implement it, more just I wasn't really sure what it even meant. Um, but we, at least at the training stage. But I'd be curious to talk about it more if you had thoughts. Uh, yeah, not off the top of my head, but maybe something we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Thanks. Okay, I think we should uh, at least close the official part of the seminar. Uh, and let everybody politely leave if they want, if they need to be somewhere. And those that potentially have some additional questions, uh, you can stay in the call. Yeah, thank you all uh, very much. And yeah, let's let's thank again uh, Sebastian for a great talk. Thanks, thanks very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.